Hi, I'm Molly from horticulture.co.uk and today I'm joined with Dr Toby Musgrave, a garden historian and designer. Toby, do you want to explain a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I guess I'm, I would call myself a, a, a garden historian, a plants historian. Um, so my background is, is through horticulture, but um, when I started studying garden design, I got involved in garden history as well. And then uh, that became a bit of a passion. So, so I kind of pursued a, a path in garden history. So that's kind of where I am now. Uh, yeah, not many of us are around. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you developed your own in- interest in horticulture and garden history in particular? Well, I, I kind of think it was actually in the blood. Um, my maternal family have, have always been um, very, very keen in gardening and, and, and fantastic gardeners. So, you know, I have these memories of, of growing seeds in my uh, grandfather's shed and being in gardens ever since I could sort of crawl. Um, and on my paternal side, my father worked a lot um, as an anthropologist in Greece. So when I sort of grew up and went to sort of higher education, I did a degree in horticulture. Um, for which two years was very, very scientific and, and all the sort of skills and arts and sciences of, of, of horticulture. And then for the final year, I got a chance to, to specialize and I, I sort of opted for the garden design, uh, route. And, and as part of that, um, I did a module on garden history and it's like, whoa, gardening and history come together in one and the sort of two sides of my family. And that got me really excited. I just loved that idea of, of, of garden history, not just how gardens look down the years and how styles and and themes and and what have you changed but very much the fact that gardens are such a sort of intrinsic part of our culture of our society of our life um that really got me excited and and also as works of art you know i think they tend to get gardens get very much overlooked as works of art so that got me uh through my degree and then um i started teaching and got involved with the warwickshire gardens trust um or the setup of that, and and then sort of decided that actually gardening was garden history was really where I wanted to go, uh, and sort of went back and did a PhD in in garden history, and then kind of fell into sort of freelance work after that. Actually, over the years, you've obviously written numerous books and articles on garden history. Um, do you have a particular favorite of those you've written, or a few favorites that you'd like to share? I don't think there's any any sort of particular favourites uh, per se. Some of the ones I really enjoyed writing are also the ones which have people involved. So things like book on the plant hunters, um, you can see the links with the gardens, but the sort of the stories of the of the, of the plant hunters themselves were, you know, exciting to research. Um, that kind of been done before, but it did it with a bit of a new spin. Um, one of the other books I really enjoyed writing was actually about the head gardeners um, because. Once again, one of the things that struck me down the years, we all sort of, uh, particularly with historic landscapes, historic gardens, we talk about then Lord this, Lady that, Sir the other who paid the bills and had the garden created. Um, and perhaps we'll talk about the famous designers, Kate Biltrubert and Gertrude Jeek or whatever. Um, but the people who actually sort of did the hard work uh, really got overlooked, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century. So going back and trying to sort of talk about the forgotten heroes if you like the the head gardeners themselves that was a was a really exciting interesting project to to research and, and fun what are the, the the other thing i did recently which was one of the books that i that, that uh, came out a couple of years back was uh, the garden elements and styles and that was kind of fun that was a sort of a to z of garden features um and i think one of the things that was fun about that was looking through a whole range of features some of which perhaps contemporary and some of which are known about but there was a whole load of uh, old, gar- old garden features that were kind of overlooked, forgotten about. So dusting those off and, and sort of bringing those back up to date and seeing that, you know, history can be very inspirational. You don't have to just sort of copy and paste from the past, but you can take old ideas and, and give them a very contemporary spin. So that, that was also great fun to, to look at, uh, mixing the old and the new. Obviously, those books take time to research. How do you kind of approach the research via books and what challenges might you encounter whilst doing that? I kind of tend to start at the beginning and, and then just work the way through. And, and certainly sometimes if you're doing sort of uh, primary uh, source research, you find that you just go off on a tangent and something you thought about leads to something else, leads to something else, or you discover something along the way that uh, uh, is exciting and new. Finding information these days has gotten a lot more easy, uh, thankfully, with the internet and what have you. And there's so many more resources that have been digitized and made available. So there was a bit of a hiatus when 
Um, well, there still is to an extent, but with certain old resources, there was very few archives or libraries that held those. So it was always a bit of a sort of schlep to get from A to B to go find them and what have you. But now it's much easier with uh, things like the Biodiversity Heritage Library dot org, very snazzy title. But you know, there's such a huge wealth of of, of old data still out uh, that's been digitized, which is you know you can just download with a click of a mouse. And also keyword search, which is amazing. So um, it's it's still challenging, but it's it's certainly gotten a lot easier. So in your opinion, how has garden design evolved over the years, perhaps even the centuries? I think one of the very positive things about garden design and, and garden making is that um, it's very much for the individual now. Um, I think the fact that there's no no prescription there's no fashions you have to follow uh, i think it's very exciting i think that the fact that you know you can make a garden be exactly what it is to meet your needs and wants um you know we've never been in a position where we've had this huge diversity of materials and plants from which to to choose so you know i think uh, contemporary garden makers are in a really really lucky place and i think that idea that gardens are for people that, that um it doesn't matter what age you are, what 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 gender you are, what what religion you are, where you come from. Uh, gardens, one of the gardening and garden making, is one of those really leveling things. It's it's just about you and about other people. And in many ways, I think it's a it's a great tool for for integration, for getting to meet people. And I guess another one, the thing that sort of I think that's sort of got more popular, if you like, over the years. I mean, is is the whole growing for yourself. I mean, back in the day, you know, people who could afford it would have a vegetable garden. And of course, that was providing for the house or houses. Um, and then I guess vegetable gardening went a bit, you know, off out of fashion, if you like. You know, the garden, you know, the allotment was for some old bloke in a flat cap with whippets. And it was a sort of considered to be a little untrendy, but um, certainly was when I started gardening. Um, and it's it, that's one of the things that's totally changed as well. And the fact that you can get people interested in gardening, getting kids interested in gardening and growing their own and seeing the provenance of food, growing organically, conserving heritage varieties, you know, and then from that leading into cookery and healthy eating and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, from that point of view, I think gardens are very inspirational. And so I think, you know, we can look at garden styles that have changed around the world and between different cultures and and, and all of that. And there's a whole interesting story to be said that uh, and talk about, you know, features and elements and styles and what have you. But from a, just from a general perspective, I think the fact that, that gardening is for people these days, it, it's, it's just a much more homogeneous and inclusive pastime, which I think can only be encouraged and should, should only move forward. Are there any historical gardens that you find particularly fascinating and why? I think all gardens have a story to tell. Um, and I think that's one of the things I love about garden histories. <clears throat> you can go to any National Trust garden. You can go to any Italian Renaissance garden. You can go to Versailles go to the States and see Mount Vernon or whatever, just a handful. But I think one of the things that I enjoy about garden visiting uh, is, is not only just going to the garden and seeing how people have uh, created a particular garden uh, in a particular style, in a particular place at a particular time. The story of the people that behind the garden is something that always fascinates me. And just asking the question, why? Why does the garden look like this? Why did someone create this this way? Um, that always fascinates me. And I think knowing a little bit about garden history sort of brings so much more depth to, to visiting a garden, unless you've got a classical education these days, which very few people do. You know, we still can't do all of that, but you can get a, a little bit more understanding of the garden if you have that sort of a few nuggets of knowledge. There's so many layers of the landscape there. And again, the story that there's the, the huge allegorical story, particularly the William Kent landscape. Um, a, a, a rival garden at the time, I think it was West Wickham, as a Francis Dashwood of Hellfire Club fame or infamous. You know, and that's got to be the most libidinous landscape of the 18th century. And I think, again, it's just a piece of fun. Are there any particular flowers or plants that you're particularly fond of, especially maybe for use at this time of year in the garden? It sounds very old-fashioned. I actually really like species and, and, and sort of natural, as nature intended. Um, yeah, another horrible plug here, but I did a book recently with a mate of mine and called Wild Edens, and it was very much about looking at the garden plants that we're familiar with, but looking at them in their wild setting and where they grow naturally and in sort of biodiversity hotspots around the world. But 
one of the things that was an inspiration for that book was was just the very fact that when the plant hunters actually brought back the plants, they were bringing back, you know, the species plants or, or forms or varieties that nature had produced. And in many cases, I, I think they have so much more to offer. I'm going to be hated by plant breeders for saying that. And of course, there's a place for those. But I, I just like the simplicity of the natural plants. So, you know, for example, I mean, Lilium regali is just one of my favorite uh, plants ever. Um, just, just, just stunning. This time of year, I think some of the the species Mahonias, that whole idea of the, that evergreen, the, the 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 coming into to winter flower, uh, winter uh, honeysuckle is is just a delight. Uh, winter jasmine, I always think should should smell nice. Um, and also, I guess sort of just as it's sort of happening at the moment, just Japanese maples. Um, just so many different. Uh, that was one species that has just so many different uh, cultivars and what have you that. Provides so much color and, and delight in the in the twilight year months of the year. What future developments in the field of horticulture and garden design are you most excited about at the moment? One of the things I've been interested in uh, reading about recently is this idea that that uh, obviously we need to feed more people around the world, and with the constant uh, issue of climate change and and particularly uh, places becoming hotter and drier. This idea of of going back and looking at some of the early sort of very very early agricultural crops that we used to change from you know hunter gatherers to human uh, villagers, if you like, way way back in the agricultural revolution, the idea of taking some of those and looking at the genetics of why those plants were so successful and maybe breeding those into to more agricultural crops. I think in terms of garden design itself, as I said, I think it would be one of the things I like to see is that idea of of mixing a lot of new materials hard landscaping uh, with planting um, and I think that's something that um, is going to get more and more exciting there's just this ever increasing range of of funky materials I think that the new ideas new technologies uh, is something that could, could really apply to gardens um, and see if we can as I said keep a contribution to the wildlife for someone who's perhaps looking to learn a little bit more about garden history or even garden design, are there any resources or books that you recommend? There's quite a, a good range of, of sort of inspirational books um, uh, from from I've, I've written a few with Fiden, the publisher. So things like the the Gardener's Garden, the English Gardener's Garden, um, Garden Elements and Styles. There, there's sort of good mix of history and inspiration in terms of the illustrations in in those. Um, I think in terms of garden design, um, there's various uh, books out there that provide a good good range of of introductions. In terms of of, uh, of websites, there's one called GardenVisit.com is 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 a good resource. Um, and there's various courses. As a lot of online courses, My Garden School, for example, does a, a lot of very good courses into to learn a little bit about garden history and, and, and gardening sort of from, from online teaching and what have you. Um, I just, I mean, best is just take a Google, I think a lot of the time and just have a, have a look through and see what you can find. Sometimes you just go off in these weird directions and find some very interesting things that you never expected to, to learn along the way. Can you give us a sneak peek into anything that you're currently working on? There's a few things out in the in the ether or in the melting pot at the moment. Um, so hopefully something's going to uh, gel before too long. There's some press discussions going on. Um, so yeah, there's a few ideas that that are looking to to make happen, but nothing actually sort of coming out in the the immediate future. If our viewers would like to get in touch, um, where can they find you? I've got my website tobymusgrave.com, and you can get hold of me through that. Um, I'm also on uh, whatever it is X these days. Um, Garden history, I think, is my handle there. Uh, there's links on the on the website as well. I'm also on Instagram and all the other ones as well. So, but I thought all the links are on tobymusgrove.com. Great, thank you, Toby.